Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. I'm very excited to be with you tonight. Rachel asked me to cover target therapies for breast cancer. My plan tonight is to cover all subtypes of breast cancer, including hormone positive, HER2 positive, and also triple negative breast cancer. Let's get started. Um, let me see. Rachel, I'm not sure if I'm co host here. Um, it's a little bit delayed to move to the next slide. So our pathologic colleagues have long known that breast cancer is not one disease. First, they divided into different histological types like invasive ductal cancer, invasive lobular cancer, and then assign grades based on the growth rate of the cancer, slow grade one, intermediate grade two, or fast grade or grade three. It wasn't until the year 2000 when researchers Chuck Peru and Sorley used a new technique called gene expression profiling and published several thousand of breast cancer data showing that based on gene expression profiling, breast cancers were divided into four different subtypes. They called them luminal A, luminal B, HER2 enriched, and basal-like. Let's talk a little bit, what does it mean? So the luminal A is the traditional slow-growing breast cancer that has very strong estrogen and progesterone expression and HER2 negative that has the most favorable prognosis. The luminal B subtype also has estrogen and progesterone expression. They may also express HER2, but they are fast-growing. Their growth index is high. The normal all like was dropped out because it turns out that those were just normal breast cells uh, in a specimen. So we left with the HER2 positive and basal like subset. The HER2 positive subset has the HER2 expression, but no estrogen and no progesterone. And those are getting more aggressive type of cancer. Lastly, the basal like, or otherwise we call it triple negative that does not express estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 has the most aggressiveness. And in the past, they only been treated with chemotherapy. If we look specifically the hormone receptor positive breast cancers, we see that the luminal A has a better prognosis. On the right box, you see this little circle line um, that has the longer term survival higher compared to luminal B, which is the light blue line. But when tamoxifen used, they both respond, but still the prognostic difference remains. First, I'd like to cover target therapy for the hormone receptor positive subset. We will talk briefly about endocrine therapy, um, the new cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, data about pi 3 kinase inhibitors, and mTOR inhibitors. In the late 1800s, an English surgeon from Edinburgh by the name of George Thomas Bateson noticed um, that in his experiments with rabbits, when the rabbit's ovaries were removed, the milk production stopped. That made him wonder whether there could be a connection between the ovaries and breast. He started using his knowledge in his clinic. He was seeing a lot of advanced breast cancer patients. And as he offered these women to remove their ovaries, he did see clinical improvement in a breast cancer. Not known at that time, but he was basically the first discoverer of the estrogen. What happens, what differentiate cancer cells from the normal cells, that while the normal cells have a few protein expression uh, that is driving uh, the cell growth, once the cancer, um, or once the tissue becomes cancerous, it multiplies these growth factor expressions. There could be estrogen or progesterone receptor and other growth factor that fueling 
a rapid growth and division. This is a busy slide, but what I wanted to illustrate is how many different areas we can target the hormone receptor pathways. On the left, oh, you see the little green uh, circle, and that's estrogen. Estrogen is made from aromatase inhibitor or aromatase enzyme from the androgen. And that's one area that we can target through the aromatase inhibitors. In young women, we can stop estrogen production by using ovarian function agonist. The estrogen typically coupled with the estrogen receptor and additional activators, and then drives cancer or drives growth of the cell. We can also target the estrogen receptor and that's tamoxifen, or a selective estrogen degrader, which is full vestrant. The recent research, however, focused more on these estrogen receptor regulatory elements. And on the right side, we see a whole slew of activation pathways, most notably the PI3 kinase mTOR pathways that directly regulates the estrogen regulatory elements. Moreover, within the cell cycle, we have cell cycle blockade regulated by cyclin D and cyclin dependent kinase interaction. These all provides nowadays new areas where we can target cancer growth in estrogen positive breast cancer. If we look first in early stage hormone positive breast cancer. Those are the luminal light cancers. The treatment depends on their stage, which covered by lymph node involvement, the grade, and we use a lot of molecular testing to decide whether endocrine therapy alone is appropriate or for the higher risk cancers, chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. In metastatic cancer formation, what happens is the estrogen receptor either downregulated or pick up new mutations or additional growth factor mutations occur on a cells. How we can find it out? In a metastatic setting, we like to biopsy the recurrent tissue and find out of these additional growth factors or mutations that we can target with targeted therapy. Let's start first talking about cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors. These are used in metastatic breast cancer and some in early stage breast cancer as well. The first of these medication that was investigated was palbocyclib. It was used in postmenopausal women. Um, who had hormone positive or two negative breast cancer and added this albocyclib, which is an oral medication to an approved hormone blocker pill, letrozole. Previously, we knew that in a metastatic setting, using just hormone blockage alone, keep cancer under control for about a year or slightly over a year. But this study showed that by blocking the two different pathways, the estrogen and the cyclin dependent kinase pathways, it protected from cancer progression for up to two years. This was the first major improvement in targeted therapy in hormone positive breast cancer. Since the discovery of palbocyclib, additional such enzyme inhibitors were reported. The Monarch Free trial used a similar medication, a democyclib, and the results were very similar. Compared to hormone blocking therapy alone, the targeted therapy, the democyclib, nearly doubled the progression free survival until two years. These medications 
have side effects, albeit much milder compared to chemotherapy. Babocyclib can cause low blood counts, anemia, and fatigue. Abemocyclib has a particular side effects of diarrhea. Looking at the next target in hormone-positive breast cancer, this mTOR inhibitor, which is an oral medication called erolimus, has been tried in metastatic cancer after the patient already treated with a combination of CDK46 and hormone blocker. In this study, they used a different hormone blocker, examestane, and they targeted therapy mTOR inhibitor erolimus. In the second line setting, previously that was refractory to endocrine therapy, we saw a doubling of the response and survival from four months to 10.8 months. Throughout the presentation, you will see these similar curves that each of these targeted therapy adds additional months, if not years, to survival. And these are without the chemotherapy toxicity. Lastly, let's review the data on the phosphatidyl inositol kinase mutation. And this is the newest targeted therapy in metastatic hormone positive breast cancer. When we test the tumor tissue, and I emphasize that's always a great idea to test tumor tissue, about 30 to 40% have this PI3 kinase mutation. And for those tumors, a targeted therapy has been tested in a second or third line setting. In this solar study, they randomized patients to either an injectable hormone blocker, full restaurant, or a combination of the hormone blocker and the targeted therapy together. Again, what we saw is nearly doubling the survival from five months to almost 12 months in a previously treated setting. So each of these treatment adds very important prolongation of survival without the use of chemotherapy. This is the current schema of how we treat hormone positive metastatic breast cancer. If there is a very rapid progression, what we call visceral crisis, which means the cancer spread to the liver, or lung, or brain, those patients unfortunately still need chemotherapy. But majority of these hormone-positive cancers are more favorable and slower growing, and then we start with endocrine combination. The first line is a combination of hormone blocker and cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. So let me go back. Um, in a second line setting, we use full vestrant with similar or different cyclin-dependent kinase or move down to erolimus examestine combination. And what I should add, now that we have uh, the PI3 kinase inhibitor that is now approved in second line and further treatment. Only if the cancer became refractory to all these treatment, then has to go through chemotherapy combination. Moving on to HER2 positive breast cancer. I'd like to touch on molecular and monoclonal antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, oral tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and some data that was recently published about these HER2 low subsets that gives us more treatment options. The HER2 targeted therapy has been one of the major success stories in breast cancer history. But a little bit of background. There is this theme, what we call oncogenic addiction in cancer. The way I would illustrate is that in order for a tumor to proliferate and produce extra DNA and protein, there is a regulatory element. And that's what is on this, element, on this uh, picture called enhancer. Think about it like a light switch. You switch the light on, and then the gene is transcribed, and a protein is produced. In many cancers, what happens is they magnify 
what additional enhancers occur. And that has a magnifying, multiplying effect on the gene transcription. HER2 is one of these super enhancers. Once the cancer pick up this HER2, the proliferation of the cancer cells really magnified and multiplied. So targeting that is basically like finding the Achilles heel of this cancer. And if we block this super enhancer, we, we can control the tumor proliferation. The first such medication was trastuzumab. Trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody. You see this little Y-shaped molecule that basically block the normal dimerization, the coupling of the two HER2 protein that is required for tumor cell growth. So once we block this coupling, then it put a stop gap onto cancer cells. However, we also know that besides cancers, there are other tissues in a body that also has HER2 expression. Such tissue is the heart muscle. The heart muscle also has HER2 and HER4 receptors, and those could be slightly activated with trastuzumab. So there is a side effect of any HER2 targeted therapy that can cause some heart muscle dysfunction or in more advanced stages, heart failure. So it's very important to monitor uh, the patient's heart function with echocardiogram before and during HER2 targeted therapy. Here was the data of the first HER2 targeted therapy, trastuzumab. In 2005, when it was presented at the National Oncology Meeting, it got a standing ovation. Why? Because previously the only treatment was available for these aggressive HER2 positive cancer is just chemotherapy. And as we see the survival rapidly declined as the years pass by. When trastuzumab was added on the standard chemotherapy, it multiplied the survival rate. And it was such an important and major improvement that has never been seen before in oncology history. It is still used very much in early and late breast cancer treatment. The second HER2 targeted molecule is called pertuzumab. It is also a monoclonal antibody that blocks not only HER2, but also the HER3 molecule. And it has been an additional effect together with trastuzumab. First, it has been tested in a metastatic setting. And what we see in this Cleopatra study, a previously untreated metastatic breast cancer patient received the chemotherapy. And in addition to trastuzumab was added a second HER2 targeted therapy, pertuzumab. And their response rate and survival rate improved from 40 to 57 months. And this was without any additional chemotherapy, just using targeted therapy. Subsequently, pertuzumab was also tested in an early stage breast cancer when we use prior to surgery to downstage the tumor, shrink it down. And on the right side of the screen, you see that in the red bars, when pertuzumab was added to the trastuzumab regimen, the response they doubled, and what we call pathologic complete response, or basically a tumor kill, more than doubled. This combination now in over 60% of the patient completely eradicates the cancer by the time surgery comes. It was a major achievement because it translates into better overall survival. So this is now the current treatment schema for HER2 positive early stage breast cancer. If we see a more local advanced, which is larger tumor or lymph node positive tumor, then we use a combination of chemotherapy and these double HER2 blockade with trastuzumab and pertuzumab before surgery to get the maximum shrinkage and benefit. 
after surgery, if there is a pathologic complete response, meaning the cancer is scarred out, then we can just use the HER2 maintenance with trastuzumab and pertuzumab for one year. If there is not a complete response, there's still residual cancer, then there is a newer treatment available for TDM1, which we'll talk about shortly. On the right side, however, an important thing about de-escalation of treatment. So if someone has a very early stage, smaller than two centimeter lymph node negative HER2 positive breast cancer, then there is an option of doing a lot less treatment than what we did previously. Only use one chemotherapy drug and a trastuzumab together for 12 weeks. And in this very early stage and favorable tumor subset, that de-escalated treatment provided over 95% of long-term cancer control and survival. If at the surgery, they do find larger tumor or lymph node positive disease, then we go through the same treatment and a dual hormone blockade. We will also talk about neuretinib maintenance, which is an option for aggressive cancer after treatment. The newer development in HER2 positive subset are these antibody drug conjugates. I call them Trojan horse. Why? Here is how the molecule is formed. It has the basic subset of a molecular antibody, similar like trastuzumab. But researchers very smartly into this trastuzumab backbone attached a tiny bit of chemo molecule. And that's the red little circle. And when this antibody targets the HER2 receptor, and attaches itself to the cancer cells, this little tiny toxin is released into the cell and help controlling tumor growth and make it more efficient tumor kill. The first such antibody drug conjugate was a medication called PDM1. It is called trastuzumab empenzine, and the little mini chemo is a metenzine. With metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, when this TDM1 was compared to traditional chemotherapy in a previously treated subset, it improved the survival by about five months in two different studies. So the FDA approved this medication basically to spare people from more chemotherapy as we progress along treatment. So this is still a current recommended second line treatment in metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. The newest one is called femtrastuzumab biroxican. This is again an antibody drug conjugate and the tiny chemotherapy that is attached to the backbone is called biroxican. Um, when compared to the previously approved EDM1 molecule in a previously treated setting, it really improved the progression-free survival of from six months to more than a year and a half. And the one-year progression-free survival went from 34% to 75%. Again, you see that each of these subsequent target therapy provides meaningful prolongation and spare people from the chemo side effects. Now, these targeted therapies, even though they don't have the traditional chemo effect, they still have some side effect. The TDM1 can cause low platelet count and elevated liver function test. And the TDXD, the deroxtican, um, has a very unique side effect as lung inflammation. So we need to monitor patients very carefully with lung CTs. When we talk about HER2 targeted therapy, the pathologist grades every breast cancer for HER2 expression. And it's either totally negative, and they call it IHC0, or go to a weak expression one plus 
a moderate or two plus or a strong expression three plus. Previously, only subset that was able to benefit from the HER2 target therapy was this IHC three plus, so the very strong expression, or the two plus that has a second or fish study that was positive. But that was only about 15% of breast cancers. A very smart study was published earlier this year that looked into can we use target for these her to weak expressing tumors, where is just one, two, or, or one plus or two plus. This was the destiny breast of four. And what happened, they used or uh, this trastuzumab biroxican, this uh, antibody drug conjugate, on these HER2 weakly expressed tumors. Again, our majority was hormone positive and also this weakly HER2 positive subset. Um, a minor component was um, estrogen receptor negative and HER2 weak subset. And what was found, this HER2 targeted antibody in these HER2 weak cancers provided a meaningful prolongation of disease-free survival um, and doubled from about five months to nearly 10 months. This is now offered for patients whose tumor traditionally has not been called HER2 positive, but HER2 weak. So it's very important to know your cancer subtype because that can offer additional treatment for you that is not a chemotherapy. The next group of HER2 targeted therapy is a small tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So we talked so far about these antibodies that attach to the outside of the HER2 molecule, outside of the cell. We have these oral small molecular inhibitors that targets the inside portion of the HER2 molecule. And you see them listed here, lopetinib, naretinib, pyrotinib, and tucatinib. I'm not going to cover all, but just point out some important development and where we can use them best. Naretinib, one of these um, oral inhibitors, had been tested for early stage cancers in a really high risk patient population. High risk was defined as people who had chemotherapy prior to surgery. They did not have a complete response. And they had larger tumor over two centimeter and lymph node positive subsets. In these patients uh, who completed one year of HER2 maintenance with trastuzumab, they offered one year of maintenance with this new targeted oral medication, naretinib. And the addition of this one year of oral treatment uh, provided some benefit. If you looked at all women in the study, it was about a 3% benefit. But if we narrow down to the highest risk of population who had residual disease after treatment, there was nearly a 7% absolute benefit. What we need to realize that this study was published before pertuzumab was available, and there's no clear data of how should we use this medication after we already used a trastuzumab, pertuzumab maintenance. So we individualized for every patient and preferably use it for the high risk subpopulation because it can cause diarrhea. Moving on to the metastatic setting. Along the course of HER2 positive metastatic cancer, almost a third of the patients unfortunately will develop brain metastases. And until recently, it carried a pretty poor prognosis. But some of these new oral target therapies changed. Tucatinib is one of these oral molecules that, based on their small molecule size, is able to go through what we call a blood-brain barrier that normally protect the brain tissue uh, to get through toxins, but also protect to get through 
refer to targeted therapies or traditional chemotherapies. And when these tucatinib has been combined with the previously available treatment, keep cytobine oral chemotherapy and trastuzumab monoclonal antibody, there was a 67% decline in progressing brain metastases. And in this subpopulation that traditionally had a very poor prognosis and without the combination, very few people lived to one year, now we see a 40% survival at one year with this combination. And I have patients who had been on it for over two years now. Tucatinib can cause also some diarrhea, but overall, it's a very well-tolerated medication. Here's the schema of how we treat metastatic HER2 positive breast cancers. So first line, we use two targeted therapy, monoclonal antibodies, pertuzumab and pertuzumab with a taxane. And now in a second line setting, we have already two medication, the previously approved antibody drug conjugate PDM1 and the newer one, pertuzumab deroxycan. And if the cancer still progresses through these, then additional multiple targeted therapy with small molecular inhibitors are now available. So HER2 target therapy, really a great success story. And these women have now multiple years of survival. Lastly, let's talk about the triple negative breast cancer subset. Traditionally, it had been an orphan subset of breast cancers because nothing but chemotherapy was available. But recently we have three additional new target therapy and we're going to cover the PARP inhibitors for those women who had the BRAC mutation, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and another set of antibody drug conjugates. So what about these PARP inhibitors that a lot of people are very excited about? And how do they work? When our cells divide and multiply, occasionally there are little mistakes in the genetic um, oversight, what we call single strand break. But our cells have a very smart machinery to repair those breaks and continue to divide. And that machinery called poly ADP ribase phosphate. So basically that's an enzyme that fix those little nicks and then able to continue to proliferate. If the enzyme is not functioning, then eventually more and more breaks accumulate and we develop double strand breaks. But our cells are pretty much set up for survival mode. And we have another enzyme um, called BRCA enzyme that able to fix these double strand breaks. What happened, however, is in BRCA defective cells, then that repair is lost. If we block these PARP enzyme, that corrects the single cell break. And the BRCA is also deficient, then those cells will not be able to repair themselves and won't survive. So that provides a very smart treatment option for those cells and those patients who had BRCA mutated cells. In an early breast cancer triple negative setting, the Olympia study used an oral inhibitor of the SPARP enzyme called Oleparib versus a placebo for those patients who went through prior chemotherapy and surgery, but had residual disease at the time of surgery. And for this subset, the addition of Oleparib for one year improved uh, their survival and the three-year survival rate went from 77 to nearly 86%. That was an improvement when previously only chemotherapy was available for these triple negative cancer patients. The side effects of these SPARP inhibitors are listed. The common ones could be low blood counts, such as anemia or low white blood cell count, but can also cause fatigue um, and rarely decrease appetite. 
moving on to the metastatic triple negative subset. It's very important that if someone is diagnosed with a metastatic disease to biopsy that site of metastases and test the tumor for molecular testing. Because that way we can identify targetable mutation. If have not been tested for the BRCA gene, definitely test for the BRCA mutation because that now provides additional treatment. Using this PARP inhibitor olaparib in a metastatic setting, after the patients had been treated with at least one line of chemotherapy, also improved the cancer survival from 4.2 months with a traditional chemo to seven months. And this may not sound a lot, but that would be meaningful for someone who does not need to have their hair losing or nausea or the traditional chemotherapy side effects. Second target therapy in triple negative subset is a group of treatment called immune checkpoint inhibitor, or traditionally we call them immunotherapies. How these immunotherapies work? For the immune system, and that's the blue cells, our T cell here, in order to recognize the cancer, we need to have an antigen expression and also certain recognition molecule. The PDL1 is a receptor that is present in many of our cells, and that gives the immune system a signal that don't target me, this is my own cells. So once the PDL1 is expressed on a cell, the T cell will not attack. It will be blocked. It will say, this is my own tissue, not an invader. Unfortunately, cancer cells are smart, and many breast cancers do express this PDL1 molecule, therefore, evades the immune surveillance of the T cells. In the triple negative subset, about 40% of breast cancers expresses this PDL1. Lately, smart treatments that targeted the PDL1 or the PD receptors that able to block, and now the T cells can be activated, recognize the tumor, and able to kill the tumor. The first such study was the keynote study that compared in metastatic previously untreated triple negative breast cancers, either a traditional chemotherapy or adding on pembrolizumab, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. For those patients who had a low expression of this PDL1, the addition of checkpoint inhibitors provided some improvement in their survival, but it was modest, about two months. However, that subset that has a very strong PDL1 expression, and it's the CPS score that the pathologist reports was over 10, their survival improved significantly. Um, in the triple negative subset, when they tested, um, about 75% um, were a milder expressor, but then nearly 40% had the strong expression. And here again, those who had the high CPS score, very strong PDL expression, they derived the most benefit of the um, inhibitors, the immune checkpoint inhibitor, um, improved survival by about seven months. This is now an approved treatment in a first line, previously untreated triple negative breast cancers, but it only works if the cancer expresses the PDL1. The same concept had been tested in early stage breast cancer. These are the patients who get chemotherapy first prior to surgery. The keynote study added the checkpoint inhibitor pembrolizumab on the top of chemotherapy 
prior to surgery and provided a nine dose maintenance after surgery. And what we saw, the addition of pembrolizumab improved the cancer downstaging. Again, the pathologic complete response, which is very important for pathologists because once the cancer is totally eliminated with the chemo, uh, they have a much better prognosis. And their survival improved by about 6%. These checkpoint inhibitors do not have the chemotherapy side effects, but they have their very unique side effects. They can cause some autoimmune inflammation in certain tissues in our body. The most common is the thyroid gland that can be either over or under functioning during the treatment of these checkpoint inhibitors. But these immune checkpoint inhibitors also can cause lung inflammation, pneumonitis, liver inflammation, hepatitis, or colon inflammation, colitis, and rarely skin rashes. These are rare side effects, typically two to 3%, but we need to be aware and treat with steroids if they occur. Lastly, I would like to bring up the antibody drug conjugate concept also in a triple negative setting. Remember the Trojan horse concept in the HER2 positive cancers? Well, similar molecules were designed in the triple negative cancer. So here's the antibody and linked to this antibody, a little small chemo drug, a chemotoxin that internalized into the cancer cells and provide direct tumor kill. There is one approved treatment already called sesituzumab, um, and the chemo, little chemo part of that is a topiosomerase inhibitor, COVID-TKN, but there are several additional ones are in development. What sesituzumab provided in a previously treated metastatic triple negative breast cancer is magnified a progression-free survival almost tripled from near less than two months to nearly six months. The adverse effects were mostly low blood counts, low white blood cells, would be mild hair loss, diarrhea, and nausea. This is now an approved medication for previously treated metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So here is the current schema of how we treat, what are the options for metastatic triple negative cancer. We test first for immunotherapy responsiveness. For those cancers that have PDL expression, we treat them with a combination of pembrolizumab, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and chemotherapy. For those cancers that have the BRCA gene mutation, now we have the PARP inhibitor option. And for those who do not express, they still need to go through chemotherapy first. And in a second line setting, these antibody drug conjugate sesituzumab is approved. So in cancer research, the rule of three is to find target on a cancer cells, translate into actionable pathways, and prove that principle in a clinical trial setting so we can measure the survival and outcome, and most importantly, disseminate the knowledge so we can use to treat people. What can you do as a patient? Well, question us, question the status quo. Don't be bashful to bring up your concerns and questions because we learn just as much from smart questions that has not been as before. I always advise cancer patients to undergo a new biopsy in a metastatic setting. As the cancer progresses, it typically picks up additional mutations. And many of these mutations, now we have investigational or approved targeted therapy. So that can provide significant improvement for you without use of chemotherapy. I always encourage everybody to volunteer, participate in clinical trials, because that's how science moves forward and new treatments. If we combine the treatment team, like a patient, a researcher, and a clinician, it's an unstoppable. Thank you so much, and I'm ready to take questions.
Thank you, Dr. Salty. I'll pause the recording and that way we can start the questions.